is speaking uh, on a paper called A Māori Constitutional Tradition. Kawan is of Ngāti Kahanunu and Te Atanga uh, Mahaka, Mahaki descent. He's a lecturer at Victoria Law School. His primary interest areas relate to the Treaty of Waitangi and Indigenous legal traditions. Before joining the faculty in 2006, he worked in a number of different roles, including working at the Waitangi Tribunal, the Māori Land Court, and the Office of Treaty Settlements. Cowan has recently completed a PhD through the University of Victoria, the Canadian one, not the New Zealand one, in British Columbia, with his dissertation being the Treaty of Waitangi Settlement Process in Māori Legal History, and he's also co-editor of the Māori Law Review. Thank you, Cowan. Tēnā koutou katoa, uh, ngā mihi mahana kia koutou. Uh, just before I begin, I wanted to uh, thank the organisers um, and particularly thank them for helping me to reschedule because I need to uh, shoot off a little earlier this afternoon to catch a flight. And that leads me to uh, also make an apology that I'll need to leave very much immediately at the end of the session. I want to try and um, stay for as, as much of the questions and discussion as I can, uh, but please uh, I apologise for that if... Uh, in advance if I need to leave. So I'm going to be talking about uh, what I've called a Māori constitutional tradition. Um, and I think the first thing I should note is that I think we can speak of it in the singular. I think we can talk about a Māori constitutional tradition. And uh, perhaps if I'd been bolder, I might have even entitled my paper The Māori Constitutional Tradition. Um, but that might have seemed a bit like spoiling for a fight, uh, because there is, of course, an incredible diversity of constitutional thought and practice amongst Māori communities, uh, as there is amongst non-Māori communities. Nevertheless, um, I'd suggest that this diversity of constitutional thought and practice is all directed by key institutions that structure the exercise of public power in te ao Māori, in the Māori world. And those are institutions like whanaungatanga, and that's the centrality of relationships, or tapu and noa, uh, concepts which acknowledge the spiritual aspect of all things. And so I'll talk a little bit more about those, uh, some of those in a moment. But first, today I'd like to set out how I think uh, my paper connects with some of the uh, important ideas that my colleague uh, Marmory Stevens has been working with recently. Uh, how, how the constitutional tradition that I'm talking about sits alongside Māori attitudes about the exercise of civic decision-making power that she has, has recently uh, spoken about and written about. And then I'd like to talk about some of these key institutions of Māori law, uh, whanaungatanga, mana and rangatiratanga, manaakitanga, kaitiakitanga, tapu, noa and utu, and I'll explain uh, what I mean by each of those uh, as I go through some in a little bit more detail than others. And then finally I'd like to talk through uh, a couple of examples that I think demonstrate the way in which these key values uh, or institutions operate to construct a Māori constitutional tradition. So turning first to uh, the, the work that Māmari has done, and uh, some of you will be able to have the opportunity to hear from her later today. Uh, so just to pick up on a couple of points that she has made, Māmari's identified in her work, she's identified a Māori demos. So uh, that is the Māori community of citizens that's been able to utilise collective choice and act collectively to achieve public ends. And she's talked about how the fact that this is not, of course, necessarily the same as the Māori ethnos, the ethnic group that's linked by whakapapa. And she's undertaken a, a textual analysis to examine key aspects of Māori constitutional culture as evidenced by the development of, of various approaches to political organisation. And uh, in summary, she... she argues a couple of things about the attitudes, Māori attitudes, uh, to the exercise of civic decision-making power. First, she says that there are some observable and identifiable Māori attitudes about the exercise of civic decision-making power, particularly as to how that exercise of power ought to be carried out. And she makes it, uh, three points, really, uh, on this aspect. She says, firstly, civic decision-making power ought to be exercised as a means of meeting collective obligation for civic ends. In other words, 
this power ought to be carried out in the exercise of civic collectivism for the good of Māori beyond close kin groups, potentially for the benefit of many or even all Māori. Secondly, civic decision-making ought to be carried out in such a way that provides for substantive group participation and public input, and with due process and regard for the standing of those involved. And Māori has talked about civic decision-making as, as a, a type of exercise of, of uh, 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 or a demonstration of Māori constitutionality, but one that may not necessarily be enforced by the backing of constitutional institutions in the same way that broadly talking about an exercise of public power might be. And so what I'd like to do is to build on, on Māori's conceptualisation of, of the Māori demos and Māori constitutionality, and then examine some of the key institutions of the Māori world that describe the exercise of public power and its regulation, and so, I think, comprise a Māori constitutional tradition. So looking at some of these key constitutional institutions that, that underlie uh, the, some of the conclusions that, that Māori has reached. So uh, I think a, a kind of basic comprehension of the key features of the institutions that underlie the Māori legal system is central to considering the operation of a Māori constitutional tradition. And we've, we've touched on this a little bit this morning already in some of the previous papers, but the Māori legal system is really based upon a system of tikanga, which is the right or correct or the just way of doing things. And that system of tikanga is in turn based upon a set of underlying values or uh, the key values that I've identified here as the key institutions of a Māori constitutional tradition. And there's a little bit of debate around the kind of precise set of values that might be said to form the underlying basis of the system of tikanga. But um, the, I'm going to use the following five which, which seem to be considered foundational by people who have written in this field. So I'm going to talk about uh, whanaungatanga, which is the centrality of relationships to Māori life, manaakitanga, which is, uh, and, and kaitiakitanga, manaakitanga being about nurturing relationships, looking after people, being very careful about how others are treated, and kaitiakitanga embodying a kind of Māori ethic of stewardship and guardianship. Thirdly, mana, uh, which is the importance of spiritually sanctioned authority and the limits on Māori leadership, and I'll also talk a little bit, touch on rangatiratanga in that context. Tapu and noa, uh, which are concepts that reflect the respect for the spiritual character of all things uh, within the Māori world, and utu, which is the principle of balance and reciprocity. And I contend that these values are, are the key institutions of um, te ao Māori, the Māori world, which empower constitutional actors and regulate the exercise of public power. As a whole, these values or institutions reflect the importance of recognising and reinforcing the interconnectedness of all living things and maintaining balance within communities. And so collectively, they provide a framework of a Māori constitutional tradition. So just to touch on some of these key concepts, uh, to, to, to give you some explanation of what I mean by how they operate. So for Nongatanga, the, the uh, centrality of relationships, um, relationships are absolutely central to Māori society. They define rights and obligations between individuals, between communities, between the individual and the collective, between past, present and future generations, uh, between people and atua, the gods, and between people and the natural world. And relationships are therefore absolutely central to Māori law and a Māori constitutional tradition. Uh, and, and so a Māori constitutional tradition needs to be understood in part through that relational lens. So matters such as how relationships are formed, maintained, changed and dissolved are key concerns of, of the Māori legal system. And there are some observations I think that can be made about the way Māori law operates in general which illustrate the priority that's given to the maintenance of relationships within a Māori constitutional tradition. Uh, and, for example, there's significant flexibility in the application of Māori law. Uh, although precedent and past action are important sources of Māori law, the Māori legal system doesn't apply legal rules in the same way as the common law's principle of stare decisis requires. 
So precedent within Māori law is used to identify values that are important rather than rules that ought to be followed when a particular set of facts arises. And John Patterson, a Pākehā philosopher, has suggested that the narratives of past behaviour and proverbs and other sources of Māori law come together as, a, as an ethical system which provides a wide and rich range of traditional focal points and leaves it to the good sense and mana of those involved to arrive at reasonable solutions to their problems. Now this produces a quite different type of flexibility than, than the common law has. Um, so while it's an important precedent, it's an important reference point in Māori law, it's only part of a framework for applying and interpreting law within a Māori constitutional tradition. Now, this kind of approach allows for significant variation and flexibility in, the, in tikanga and in the application of Māori law, and that's significant for a number of reasons. And, and one is the particular significance that it allows different weight to be given to various factors in deciding what the correct course of action ought to be in any given situation. So a Māori constitutional tradition therefore provides that relationships can be, and often are, prioritised. And processes for making legal decisions also reflect this emphasis on relationships. Uh, there's a relatively low level of ex executive authority that's granted to leaders within Māori society. And that requires that relationships amongst members of the community are constantly maintained and nurtured. Lawmaking and dispute resolution always takes place within a careful consideration of how relationships will be affected by both process and substantive outcomes. And in analysing Māori law, it's always important to consider how a Māori constitutional tradition structures relationships between the collective authority of the community and members of or constituent groups within that community and what this indicates about the apportionment of constitutional rights and obligations within those relationships. Um, so that's a little aspect of, of the concept of whanaungatanga, and I want to just go on and, and touch on some of these other um, important uh, institutions in the Māori world, and particularly important in terms of constitutional, uh, a Māori constitutional tradition is the concept of mana, Mana is the central concept that underlies Māori leadership and accountability, and it embodies spiritually as well as democratically sanctioned authority. Uh, and the uh, Māori scholar and theologian, uh, the late Māori Marsden, described this spiritual aspect of mana as follows. So he says that mana, in its double aspect of authority and power, may be defined as lawful permission delegated by the gods to their human agents and accompanied by the endowment of spiritual power to act on their behalf and in accordance with their revealed will. This delegation of authority is shown in dynamic signs or works of power. Now there are lots of different types of mana um, and the Māori uh, scholar Margaret Mutu has categorised a number of different types of power that she's identified as relevant. She's talked about mana atua, so that's uh, the power of the gods, which is uh, given to those persons who conform to sacred ritual and principles. There's mana tupuna, which is authority that's handed down through your whakapapa or through chiefly line lineage. Mana whenua, which is mana that comes from the land. Mana tangata is the power acquired by an individual according to his or her ability and effort to develop skills and to gain knowledge in particular areas. So these different types of mana are extremely important for maintaining a relatively low level of executive authority in Māori leaders and a relatively high level of accountability of leaders to the community. And those different strands of mana um, provide for inherent limitations to the authority of rangatira or leaders within te ao Māori. Uh, and Shane Jones, uh, aspiring leader of, uh, the, aspiring to be leader of the Labour Party currently, uh, but a well-known Māori politician, Shane Jones has, has noted these sort of, of limitations in the way in which Māori leadership and rangatiratanga is exercised. And so he says, inherent in the Māori conception of power is the notion that the agent who uses it in an unprincipled manner will lose it. Authority which is exercised beyond the value framework is not rangatiratanga. Something he might like to bear in mind over the next few weeks as he's campaigning. But uh, rangatiratanga then can be seen to reflect the autonomy and the self-determination of the community rather than the absolute authority of an individual leader. 
And so that captures, I think, both the grant of public power and the limitations that the exercise of that power is subject to within a Māori constitutional tradition. I don't want to go into too much detail about some of the other concepts, but I do just want to touch on them and explain a little about what they're about. Um, manakitanga and kaitiakitanga are concepts which reflect the importance of nurturing and the responsibility of looking after those in your care. And they're, they're distinct concepts, I think. Kaitiakitanga embodies the ethic of stewardship and guardianship, uh, particularly in relation to the natural environment, whereas manakitanga encompasses selflessness and generosity and is often used to express uh, the type of responsibilities that a host has to his or her guests. And um, but both of these concepts, are, I think, are important in terms of um, demonstrating what the exercise of public power is all about and what the limitations of public power are within uh, the Māori world. And I quite like the way in which the Waitangi Tribunal dealt with this concept of kaitiakitanga in its report on the Y262 claims. Uh, and the tribunal suggests that kaitiakitanga is an intergenerational obligation that arises by virtue of kin relationship. This kin relationship may be between people or between people and the natural resources, and it supplements the idea of guardianship with a core spiritual dimension that animates the concept. Uh, and the, the tribunal points out that there's actually a close connection between kaitiakitanga and concepts about leadership and authority such as mana and rangatiratanga. And the tribunal says in the human realm, those who have mana, or to use the treaty terminology rangatiratanga, must exercise it in accordance with the values of kaitiakitanga, to act unselfishly, with right mind and heart, and with proper procedure. Mana and kaitiakitanga go together as right and responsibility, and that kaitiakitanga responsibility can be understood not only as a cultural principle, but as a system of law. So, in specific terms, then you have a situation where kaitiakitanga means that each whānau or hapu uh, kaitiaki for the area over which they hold mana or mana whenua, their ancestral lands and seas. And should they fail to carry out their kaitiakitanga duties adequately, not only will mana be removed, but harm will come to the members of the whānau and hapu. And again, I think this demonstrates the kind of clearly defined scope of public power within a Māori constitutional tradition. Turning now to, to quickly touch on tapu and noa, and this is the recognition of the spiritual dimension. Uh, tapu and noa are complementary opposites, are both central to the operation, I think, of a Māori constitutional tradition. And the concept of tapu recognises the spiritual quality of all things and the associated restrictions and regulation which necessarily, relate, necessarily relates to the spiritual dimension. Noa, on the other hand, suggests a freedom from such restriction and is often used in the context of processes which normalise or make safe interaction with things that would otherwise be restricted. And so tapu and noa play also a central role in the maintenance of Māori law, and they provide a key motivation for obedience to laws and the perceived consequences of breaching tapu act as an enforcement mechanism. And so again, I think, form part of what we can think of as a Māori constitutional tradition. And the, the final concept that I'd like to touch on is the concept of uh, utu. Uh, utu embodies the basic principle of reciprocity that underpins the operation of a Māori constitutional tradition and indeed all Māori law. Uh, it's perhaps most readily evident in cases of warfare, which has no doubt led to an emphasis on ideas of revenge when it gets translated into English. Yet the principle is also clearly evident in economic transactions and the processes of gift exchange, indicating that I think a focus on revenge is both reductive and misleading. So the concept of utu relates more broadly to maintaining balance. Uh, and as Hirini Mead has pointed out, this reflects the emphasis on whanaungatanga and the centrality of relationships within, the Māori law, uh, within Māori law. So Hirini Mead says utu is a response to a take, which is a cause of action. And once that cause of action is admitted, the aim is to reach a state of ea, which might be translated as restoring balance and thereby maintaining whanaungatanga. So it's about restoring balance, about uh, reciprocating good gifts, uh, so foodstuffs, items of clothing, tools, luxury items, responding with good gifts, but also responding to bad gifts, so insults, thefts, other offences, uh, in a way that uh, restores the balance. And 
I uh, just want to uh, give a, a sort of few examples, really, that might illustrate the way in which these kind of uh, concepts or institutions that I've talked about uh, construct a, a Māori constitutional tradition. Now, we just mentioned the idea of utu as being important in terms of maintaining balance, and Hirani Mead would talk about and say that the whole system of tikanga is really about uh, maintaining that balance, particularly where tapu might have been affected. And I think an illustration of the way in which this overall objective of maintaining balance in crucial areas of life really drives the development of Māori legal processes in accordance with a Māori constitutional tradition can be seen in the um, ritualised confiscation and sometimes destruction of property as compensation for an offence in this, this process known as muru. And there's a very famous example of, um, from the, the late 19th century um, of a, a, a large-scale muru uh, where the, the, the offence had occurred when a young couple had eloped despite their relationship being adulterous according to the practices of their communities. Both the young man and the young woman who eloped were both of high rank, so which elevated the seriousness of the situation. And under tikanga Māori, those who were affected by the couple's actions were not simply the wronged partners and the immediate families, but included the communities of all who were involved. And so it wasn't only the young man who was seen to be responsible for the offence, but his entire community. And so the process for restoring balance among the parties needed to offer some form of restitution to the communities that were wronged. And in, in this instance, the appropriate course of action was determined to be the uh, ritualised confiscation and destruction of, of the property of the young man's community. And all the affected communities were entitled to take property as compensation. And once the appropriate compensation had been made, balance was deemed to have been restored, and the previously existing marriage and betrothal between their uh, other partners uh, were annulled and the young couple's marriage, which had originally been in breach of tikanga, was deemed to have been confirmed in accordance with the community's laws. So what, what uh, the, the, and this illustrates the kind of framework that Hirani Mi talks about as important in terms of understanding tikanga Māori. And what I think his framework suggests is that there are constitutional limits to the exercise of public power in te ao Māori. So these institutions of utu, mana, tapu, manakitanga and whanaungatanga, they determine that coercive force may be appropriate for maintaining balance and redressing imbalance when it occurs. And the example of the ritualised confiscation or the muru that I've referred to um, it might be an extreme case of that, but it does demonstrate the way in which the process addresses those central values of tikanga Māori, those key institutions of Māori law. The sense of reciprocity and restoring balance that's integral to the concept of utu might be the most obvious there, but you can also see the importance of assessing the seriousness of the breach of tapu and or the offence to mana as well. And whanaungatanga plays a key role in regulating the process because muru is primarily a process for dealing with disputes amongst close to kin. Avoiding full-scale conflict is most important when all the parties are related. So without those kinship connections, a serious offence would almost certainly lead to some form of physical conflict. Um, a Māori constitutional tradition, therefore, sanctions the use of public power in accordance with the key institutions of Māori law, but only within the limits that are prescribed by those institutions. So, just to conclude, I, uh, I would contend that a Māori constitutional tradition must be understood as part of Māori culture, reflecting Māori systems of social organisation and political authority, which are aimed at reinforcing values that stem from a Māori worldview. And as I've tried to outline in this paper, these key institutions of mana, utu, tapu and noa, whanaungatanga, manakitanga really drive the development of Māori law in accordance with an identifiable Māori constitutional tradition. Kia ora koutou. Kia ora and thank you very much for that, Carwin. Our next speaker is Dr Miranda Johnson, who will be speaking on a paper entitled Who Will Sign the Problem of Authority in Māori Constitutional Debates? Uh, Miranda is currently a postdoc research fellow at the University of Sydney. She completed a PhD at the University of Chicago in 2008 and has had appointments at the University of Michigan and Wisconsin-Madison. Her first book manuscript, The Land is Our History, 
uh, examines a connected series of land and water rights cases in Australia, Canada and New Zealand. It argues for the singular importance of Indigenous rights activism to significant transformations in law and society in three settler states in the late 20th century. Thanks, Miranda. and have worn my high heels. Tēnā koutou katoa. Um, I'd like to thank the organisers of this wonderful conference uh, before I start. I'd also like to acknowledge um, the work of some people who aren't here, um, but the, it's the work of translators who've done such important work in New Zealand um, for uh, the production of history in this country. And in particular, um, I've been uh, just starting to develop a relationship with Jane McRae, who I think has done fantastic work in this country along with her late colleague uh, Jennifer Kuno and Ngāpere Hopa. Um, and I hope all of you are familiar with their work as you should be. Discussions of constitution making raise questions of authority in practical and conceptual terms as those I've used to preface this paper draw attention to. In the questions and statement on the slide, Tairoa and Paraune exist, uh, express concerns about who authorises or signs the constitution and subsequent actions of a political community. In this paper, I examine debates and disagreements about principles of authority and procedures of authorisation in political communities by examining discussions in Te Kotahitanga, or the unifying uh, Māori parliament of 1892 and 1893, and the reception of the Native Rights Bill that sought the grant of a separate constitution for Te Kotahitanga and that was debated in the New Zealand Parliament in 1894. These debates were interesting because of the multiple and cross-cutting ideas about authority that emerged among Māori participants in Te Kotahitanga, as well as between Māori and settler members of the New Zealand Parliament. In particular, I want to draw attention to a dynamic tension, and it's something that Andrew Sharp uh, began to address this morning in his paper, between ideas of unity and the notion and the demand for separation that animated debates uh, within and in response to the meetings of the Kotahitanga Parliament. And I should say, this is very new work um, that's somewhat undigested, but it's part of a new project I'm developing on the co-production between new forms of tribalism in New Zealand in the late 19th and early 20th centuries the emergence of, a new, of new forms of state liberalism and also ideas about corp the corporation and corporate personhood because I think these ideas are in fact much more entangled than we may uh, previously have um, given uh, attention to. So the Kotahitanga Parliament, or Pāre Mata Māori, that met formally for a decade between 1892 and 1902 have not been the subject of extensive historical study. This is no doubt because the of the separate political authority that the New Zealand Parliament, uh, or the British monarch, um, from whom they sought separate authority from it, was never given. And without that grant of self-government, the Kotahitanga Parliament was not able to enforce its authority as the single unifying political force of Māori tribes. Perhaps because Kotahitanga is considered to be a failed political experiment rather than a successful achievement of separate Māori power, Historians have not identified a clear origin or founding moment. Uh, people refer to older notions of Kotahitanga in the 1850s and 1860s. A number of historians refer to the emergence of new kinds of leadership in Northland and discussions of the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, they're clearer about the goals of the, mu of the movement. Uh, Keith Sinclair pointed out that Kotahitanga was seeking a kind of home rule in New Zealand. Uh, and that was very fo it was very focused on the implementation of the treaty. Hone Heke Ngāpua, the uh, uh, member for Northern Māori and a participant in Kotahitanga, uh, brought uh, a bill that came out of discussions in that parliament before the New Zealand parliament in 1894. The Native Rights Bill sought the grant of a constitution from the New Zealand parliament, which would enable a Māori parliament to enact laws dealing with the, quote, personal rights and the lands and all other property of the Aboriginal native inhabitants of New Zealand. Um, kotahitanga, of course, means uh, unity, unifying. Whaka kotahitanga was a key word that was discussed in the parliaments. Um, 
Uh, and people observe this importance of the notion of unity, uh, though again few people have actually investigated or examined or thought about what unity might have meant in this world, so different in many ways from our own. Richard Hill uh, has argued that, quote, the push for unity generally represented a way of achieving a goal rather than the end of the goal, uh, rather than itself co constituting the goal. One of the few scholars to examine the notion of kotahitanga more broadly in relation to this history of Māori political thought um, expressed frustration with the kotahitanga parliament's work. Lindsay Cox critiques kotahitanga for failing to act according to its mandate, claiming that the seeds of the parliament's de demise were its preoccupation with its own extra-legal status. At its height in the mid-1890s, nonetheless, over a thousand people attended the sittings, though by the end of the 1890s, uh, attendance had radically diminished. Key figures like Honeheke were focusing their energies on opposing the Liberal government's land policies and attempting to mitigate the effects of legislation from within the settler state. And according to most historians, Kotahitanga and its intentions were superseded by uh, the work of the Young Māori Party in the early 20th century. These accounts have not given much attention to how participants in Kotahitanga grappled with large-scale political process and new ideas about authority and power that such imagining gives rise to. Speakers in the Kotahitanga Parliament recognise the power inherent in an idea of unity, particularly in the context of acrimonious disputes over land. Unity proffered the vision of Māori acting as one in opposition to land policies of the government and the divisive effects of the native land court. Being able to demonstrate unity meant that Māori people could show that they could sign for themselves, as Paraune argued. In becoming self-authorising, Māori could establish their own authority on their own terms. Yet the notion of separatism, which was a new concept for some participants at Kotahitanga, as they comment upon, they don't know this word or co and the concept that it alludes to, contradicted some of the associations that Māori held about the notion of unity. Part of the appeal of unity was that it, ev it evoked ideas of ancestral, uh, ancestral obligation and allegiance to existing hierarchies. As Hori Kere Tairo suggested, his question, who will sign for the Māoris when the authority of the Queen has ceased, got to the heart of the matter. Tairo's concern was that should a separate constitution be granted for the Parliament, those Māoris whom the institution represented could no longer claim allegiance to, nor recognition from, the Queen. In constituting themselves, they may no longer be constituted by this relationship to her. Who would they become? Such philosophical questioning, which also indicated real anxiety about the conjuring of new forms of peoplehood, is not unique to discussions of democratic constitutionalism within Māoridom. It's a tension at the heart of the idea of traditions of the constitution. That is, how can traditions be maintained over the, over the necessary rupture that the creative act of founding in the form of a constitution brings about? It's worth remembering that the act of constituting, literally an act of setting in place or establishing from Latin statuere to set up, is also an act of separation. The word used for separation in Kotahitanga was motuhaki, a word that conveys this notion of severance and the cut that achieves it quite strongly. What might be lost and what can be invented as a consequence. As we shall see, members of Kotahitanga were creative, even innovative, as they adopted and adapted traditions of parliamentary democracy and ideas about self-government, and grafted those onto their own hierarchical norms and practices of obligation. However, allegiance to existing hierarchies and the bonds of an ancestral obligation made it difficult at the same time for members of Kotahitanga to argue for a kind of separatism that would entail severance. I think that the story I tell about Kotahitanga in the paper, the longer paper, elucidates a more general problem, that the idea of a modern secular constitution is premised in magic. As Jacques Derrida pointed out in his essay, Declarations of Independence, the, earth, the assertion that we, the people, are the authors of a founding document is a tautological one. These people do not exist. They do not exist as an entity because the entity does not exist before the declaration has been made, not as such. 
How can we, the people, or we ourselves, constitute that which constitutes us? Can we really be self-authorizing? In fact, Derrida argued, the act of the signature invents the signer. We, the people, only come into existence in the act of signing the founding document. In the longer paper, I'm not so interested in explaining the rise or decline of kotahitanga as other historians have tried to do. Rather, I'm interested in examining this tension between unity and separatism. Um, and in the longer paper, I uh, look at a number of different ways in which these, uh, these tensions emerged, um, notably in a discussion of biblical tradition, uh, practices of ancestral obligation and allegiance to hierarchy, including to the British Queen, procedures of authorization, and the constitution of democratic peoplehood. I'll just uh, go over those quite quickly. So Heta Tehara, the Tumuaki, who opened the preliminary meeting of people to discuss a unifying parliament in 1892, evoked uh, an ancient sense of peoplehood for those, for those gathered. Praise the Lord God Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Israel, for he is the God of our, our forefathers who led them forth safely across the ocean to these islands which we now inhabit, he declaimed. The invocation of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and the Israelites as the same God of those people gathered to discuss Kotahitanga um, could be unpicked in a, in a number of different ways. Uh, in my paper, I uh, discuss a few of those that I think are perhaps most significant. Um, first of all, that the God of the Israelites is a personal God, a God with a face, um, an interventionist God, and I think this is significant for how, how higher authority is being imagined in this world and also engaged. Uh, secondly, that um, this uh, may premise uh, 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 the possibility of claiming universal natural justice, which was very important to Kotahitanga members as they asked for a uh, separate constitution. Um, it also uh, defines Māori as a special people directly descended from the Israelite, Israelite tribes. You notice in that, uh, in that, in that, dis in that uh, description, he talks about this God leading them forth across the ocean. It presages the great theme of unity, just as the Israelite tribes came together in gratitude to God for freeing them from slavery, so could Māori tribes be united in their uh, potential emancipation. Uh, so I suppose what I'm trying to point out here is that unity is not simply uh, a means to an end, it is the goal. Because... Uh, in this sense, unity itself is power. But the cultural structure underpinning this notion of unity was distinct. In the minds and practices of many at Te Kotahitanga, unity did not entail egalitarianism, but rather could and should be premised in the observation of hierarchy of status and authority. Nor did the potential for unity free Māori from the obligations to the past, to ancestors and parents, and to the future generations to come. Whaka Kotahitanga did not presage a social revolution, but rather a strengthening of existing social order and control extrapolated outwards to incorporate a Māori federation. So the principle of authority was given further oh, slide two. The principle of authority was given uh, that's this one of the one of the CEOs of Kotahitanga. Um, the principle of unity uh, was given further authority by recalling the work of tribal ancestors who'd forged earlier political agreements. And Tehara pointed out that the idea uh, came from the backing of chiefs uh, from the four northern tribes. Um, and at various times, uh, members of Kotahitanga expressed various commitments uh, and, and the, noted their ancestral duty to people who'd gone before them. Um, most members of Kotahitanga expressed abiding loyalty to the crown, um, and most of uh, the tribal leaders who came um, had uh, came from tribes that had um, been on the side of Kupapa tribes um, in the colonial forces in the 1860s. Uh, several participants were um, or had been members of the New Zealand Parliament, including Taiaro and Honeheke. Indeed, engagement with the colonial state was itself an ancestral obligation for some. 
in his final testament, Horikere uh, Tairoa's father, the Ngaitahu chief Te Matinga Tairoa, had given his son the duty to ensure, quote, that the promises made by Wakefield, Kemp and Mantel were fulfilled. And Tairoa pursued that tribal claim of Ngaitahu until his death in 1905. Maintaining a relationship with the Queen was important to him, as it was uh, to many leaders. For many Māori, like Tory adherents, as uh, John Pocock has pointed out, the distinction between the Crown and the state was strategically important if they were to critique the actions of the local state by appealing to a higher authority elsewhere. And Kotahitanga also uh, envisaged sending delegates to the Queen. The maintenance of a relationship to the Queen was also important to women involved in Kotahitanga, who sought enfranchisement. Mary Mangakahia, a Te Rarawa suffragette who was married to the Premier of Te Kotahitanga, Hamiora Mangakahia, stood before the Parliament and demanded the right for women to vote since many were property holders and, quote, many intelligent women in New Zealand who marry men, uh, marry men who do not know how to run their land. And furthermore, she pointed out, there are many male chiefs in this island who have appealed to the Queen over the problems affecting them, and we have never received any advantage from their appeals. For this reason, I ask the House that women members be appointed. In this way, perhaps things will be put right, and it may be suitable for the female members to make appeal to the Queen over the problems which affect us and our lands. For perhaps the Queen will consent to the appeals from her Māori women advisers, since she is also a woman. Mary Mangaka here recognised the status of property holders and the importance of land. She brought traditions of female leadership and power to bear on the debates of Te Kotahitanga. Moreover, she suggested in that, that in the politics of Kanohi ki te kanohi, it was most effective if the faces resembled each other in terms of gender. If Māori were to appear, appeal to the higher authority of the British Queen they respected um, and who they hoped respected them, then who be better to meet her than her women advisers? Thus could Mangakahia argue for the recognition of difference within the hierarchies presupposed and reiterated by the men at Te Kotahitanga. Such negotiations of difference were intended to further strengthen the unity that Kotahitanga sought. But at the same time, we may detect another kind of problem here. If the higher authority in Britain was female, she was also white. And that racial difference and the theories of civilization and transitional development that underpinned racial hierarchies in the colonial world and in many ways still do, made it much harder for Māori leaders to achieve the respect and honour that they sought out for themselves and for their people. Um, I go on now to talk about different kinds of procedures of authorisation in Kotahitanga. Um, there were discussions about the proper election of members, collecting of monies from kāinga um, to support various activities, including potentially the buying back of land from Pākehā landholders, the establishment of a newspaper. The importance of written authorisation came up a lot. The idea of writing and of signing was crucial. Um, and this indicates, I think, how broad a Māori public had become by the end of the 19th century. It was a large-scale kind of stranger public, as, as some cultural uh, theorists would uh, describe it. The matter of pro proper authorisation raised a number of questions of representation. Um, and in particular, I just want to emphasise uh, the point that they were wrestling with what it meant to be self-authorising. They appreciated, as Derrida points out, that in order to sign for themselves, they would have to be recognised as capable of signing. For erased people who were positioned by settler power as at best in a period of transition, and at worst as savages beyond the realm of civil society, proving such capabilities to settler society was all but structurally impossible. On the other hand, I also want to emphasise, as Cowan and, and Marmory Stevens have talked about too, that this was a kind of democracy. It was premised in the will of the people, although the will was expressed in a very different way to how we might imagine it being expressed in liberal democracies. Uh, Hamiora Manga, uh, Mangaka here again um, talked about what unity meant to uh, him. 
The meaning of this word unity is an agreement by man, woman and child for there to be one rule for them. If their leader says the rule for us all is like this, the man, woman and child will all consent. If their leader says this is the path for us to travel on, they will all agree. Uh, the quote goes on, but I won't read all of it. Um, the political constituency imagined by Mangakahi was much broader than that legislated uh, by for the settler parliament. It included men, women and children. The inclusion of children, I think, is particularly interesting and it deserves further attention. Uh, I'm not aware of other, any other democratic constituencies that talk about children in this way. Um, and I should also note that in other documents that Kotahitanga produced, um, they also included children of either father or ma mother of the Māori race, thus pushing back against colonial policy that um, tended to separate half-castes from uh, the Māori body politic. Um, so I've talked about various ways that the emergent political community was imagined and represented, um, that it was large-scale, that there were various kinds of mandating procedures, and there was an expression of a collective will and a federative idea that was greater than the sum of its parts. Yet, however well Te Kotahitanga represented its procedures of, author of authorisation to itself, the parliament was, depended on, parliament was dependent on a grant of recognition from the settler parliament, whose government was increasingly focused on busting up the remaining la Māori land. So when Honeheke presented the short Native Rights Bill to Parliament in 1894, he made a number of the arguments I've discussed uh, in this paper uh, to support uh, the bill. Um, and in particular, he interpreted, uh, he, he, he talked about the 1835 Declaration of Independence. Notably, he talked about that uh, declaration as an agreement signed by the Confederation of United Chiefs with the representative of the British government. And I think that that uh, discussion of the declaration there is very interesting. It wasn't an act, in other words, of severance for him. Uh, the Premier, Richard Seddon, who was also Native Affairs Minister, didn't show up for the discussion of the bill in the House, thus stymieing the face-to-face -face politics uh, interaction that's so important um, in Māori politics. And uh, while some Pākehā members were sympathetic to in the injustices suffered, they didn't think that Māori were capable of self-rule, and in, in particular James Carroll uh, spoke strongly against the bill. Um, so when it came to vote on the bill just after 11pm, the House no longer held a quorum of, of members. As Honeheke had no doubt anticipated, the bill was dead. Paul Moon, in his biography of Honeheke, mentions that he referred to the bill at the same time as Pinepine Te Kura, with a tiny treasure. The allusion was presumably to a Ngāti Pro Ori Ori, or chant, sung to aristocratic children that teaches them about lineage. It's a complex song that I'm still researching, but I'll make two brief speculations about it here. First of all, the Ori Ori was not from his tribal area, since he was Ngāpui, but belonged and referred to the difficult journey and struggles of, an East Coast tribe, of the East Coast tribe to overcome witchcraft and settling their new lands. Perhaps this borrowing of the chant underscored the unity and struggle of Kotahitanga tribes. Second, the chants demonstrate the importance of knowing one's whakapapa, of reciting and understanding the connectedness of self to ancestors and thus to the generations to come as a manifestation of authority. Whakapapa do not invent peoples for their, nar their narrations of becoming. They do not, in my mind, do the same thing that founding documents do. And perhaps this is why Heke referred to two different ideas, a native rights bill in the Pākehā Parliament uh, and Pene Pene Te Kura in uh, his correspondence with other um, Māori friends and allies. The story of the Kotahitanga Parliament I've told has an uncertain beginning and an inconclusive end. The discussions that participants in the parliamentary debates held were not unique to them and didn't end with the demise of Kotahitanga. I think this is how it should be, for I've shown in this paper, I hope, that while participants encountered and discussed the idea of a separate constitution premised in some kind of rupture with the existing order of things, the genealogical and hierarchical political imagination that structured and gave meaning to their political practices may in fact have worked against the possibility or re and realisation of separatism. 
Um, so just in conclusion, concluding, I suppose, thinking about the story a little more allegorically, I'd like to provoke a conversation about how we might negotiate difference in discussing ideas about authority. This book, uh, I opened this paper by thanking tr the work of translators, and the work of translation, in fact, is key to this uh, work that I'm doing now. Um, if the intention of this conference is to unearth tradi trans uh, traditions, an invitation that imputes value to the existence of a plurality of tradition, traditions, then how might we understand the engagements, disagreements, and misunderstandings between political communities in terms that remain open and even hospitable to difference, which doesn't necessarily mean having to understand difference? Is a constitution the best way of facilitating such openness, or do we need to think about other formal possibilities? Kia ora. Thank you very much, Miranda. Just one housekeeping matter before we have our third speaker. We'll be moving to the bank or afternoon tea after this session, so this will be the final session that we have today uh, in this area of Parliament. The next paper is entitled The Lost Jurisprudence of the Native Land Court by Professor Richard Boast, as well as teaching and researching at Victoria Law School. Richard specialises uh, in many areas, uh, and has also appeared before the Waitangi Tribunal on numerous occasions, both as counsel and an expert witness, and has written a number of specialist reports for the Tribunal on many different issues. Richard was a member of the review panel which reported to the Attorney General in 2009, recommending the repeal of the Foreshore and Seabed Act 2004 and replacing it with new legislation. His book, Buying the Land, Selling the Land, was awarded the Montana Book Award for History in 2009. Richard is currently engaged in research work for some Hawke's Bay iwi and is also engaged in preparing an edition of the early decisions of the Native Land Court. He has a particular interest in Latin American parallels with New Zealand legal history, which he's also researching at the moment, and is also part of the Recovering New Zealand's Lost Cases project and the Legal Māori project. Go to Richard. Thanks very much, uh, Grant, and to the organisers uh, of this conference. Um, I'm just going to jump straight to part four of my paper um, because I'm not going to have time to go over the earlier stuff, fascinating as it is. The earlier part of my paper, to me, the, the earlier part of my paper looks quite closely at the judges of the Māori Land Court, uh, which is the overall subject of my paper today and looks at their background and origins. And the point that I make there is how comparatively few of them actually had any legal training. Uh, most of the judges of the Māori Land Court uh, uh, were not lawyers and came from a rich diversity of backgrounds. Uh, they were an idiosyncratic, quarrelsome bunch on the whole. Uh, with, um, uh, some had been former surveyors, some had been army officers, uh, you name it, a much more diverse institution, really, than the ordinary courts. Now, the Native Land Court was established in uh, 1862 or 1865, depends on your view, which of the two founding acts was the main one, uh, to investigate titles to Māori customary land and convert them to Crown-granted tenures. Uh, thanks. Uh, it's a pivotal institution in New Zealand legal history. I'm going to look at it in one of the more neglected uh, of its historical phases, though, which is the liberal era, the period of the liberal government from 1891 uh, to 1910. And as I note here, there can be no doubt that by this time, the public reputation of the native land court uh, had fallen to rock bottom was denounced by Māori, by lawyers, by judges, including some judges of the Native Land Court itself, uh, and to say nothing of judges of the superior courts, politicians, including premiers and attorneys general, and in newspaper editorials. It had few friends and defenders. Many of the opinions expressed today about the court by historians 
simply repeat standard critiques of the court, which became a dominant political discourse in the 1890s. Why did this critique emerge at that time? Well, part of the reason is, I think, that New Zealand itself had changed. The facade of mid-Victorian individualist liberalism, which is reflected in the 1862 and 1865 Acts, had already uh, begun to crack. Uh, Māori were no longer a strategic and military threat. Race relations were no longer the foundation of politics. The earlier judges, Fenton and Rogan, now seem to belong to an earlier world. Nor was their high Victorian liberalism the new liberalism of the 1890s. Rather than emphasising self-help, individualism and thrift, the emphases now were on protective tariffs, building railways and ports, industrial conciliation and arbitration, and enlightened legislation designed to protect women and children and improve public health was accepted that the state should play a role in achieving these goals. In this climate, the Native Land Court, a product of the different world of the 1860s, was seen as anachronistic, amateurish, old-fashioned, even as a national embarrassment. Lawyers and judges of the superior courts regarded its processes and its judges with disdain, its judges with condescension, and its decisions as untrustworthy and amateurish. This was not mere prejudice. The seemingly endless cases in the ordinary courts, not excluding the Privy Council, in fact, uh, arising from the complexities of native land court titles and jurisdictional mistakes by its judges, did nothing for the court's reputation. At the same time, there was growing pressure for a remodelling of the native land laws, widely denounced as a confusing mess, for full equality between the races, and for remedial legislation which would clarify the rights of those who had purchased Māori land in good faith, but who now found that their land titles were uncertain and vulnerable to legal challenges. <coughs> Paul McHugh <coughs> has written that the Native Land Court operated in an obscure space of its own, remote from the public gaze. But while this may have been true in the 1860s and 1870s, and possibly today, come to that, it was decidedly not true of the liberal era. On the contrary, the court was entangled in one highly public controversy after another. 1886, the court and its judges were at the center of a national political storm over the Ofaoko block, a large area of land located in, the, in an inaccessible and somewhat undervisited part of the North Island today, um, the tangle of mountain and, and uh, hill country between Hawke's Bay and Taihapi. Some of those with interest in the block had repeatedly requested a rehearing, and when these were declined, no less a person than the Premier, Sir Robert Stout, took up their cause. Stout claimed that Chief Judge Benton, uh, Benton's decision to decline a rehearing arose out of a personal conflict of interest between himself and the petitioners. Benton, Stout said, was linked to those who had been awarded the block and their Pākehā business allies and friends including Walter Buller and John Stidholm, who were business partners of the Hawke's Bay chief Renata Kawapo, and who were the lessees of the block. And in pressing for a rehearing of Ofaoko, Stout denounced the court in ringing tones, and I'll quote, if this, if this is a sample of what has been done under our native land court administration, I am not surprised that many natives decline to bring their hand be land before the courts more gross travesty of justice it, is, justice it has never been my misfortune to consider. As Martin Fisher and Bruce Sterling, who have studied this episode closely, have found, not only were these remarks quoted in newspapers across New Zealand, but they were in fact widely supported. The Native Land Court was not much esteemed by the general public. There was some dissent, however, notably from the Poverty Bay Herald, a newspaper which was well informed on Maori land issues and which believed, uh, not, in, not entirely unjustifiably, that Stout was only playing politics. And in fact, Stout was anything but a detached observer of the native land court. He had links of his own to other players in the Ofa Oko affair, including Irene Donnelly, herself trying to claim large interests in Ofa Oko. Irene was a wealthy and powerful Maori woman a pillar of the Hawke's Bay landed gentry 
and something of a professional litigant. Stout was counsel for irony in the land court in the protected Omahu case, another controversy in which irony was involved in, and a co celebre of the day. A justice of the cases that irony was engaged in was not always obvious, Omahu being one example, and her case in the Privy Council against the customary owners of the Kaiwaka block in Hawke's Bay, where she was also supported and advised by Stout, being another. Um, Irony in that case uh, defeated claims to Kaiwaka by its customary owners, ensuring that the title to the block remained in her own hands and those of her immediate family. Uh, Stout pressed, um, going back to Ofaoko, Stout pressed for the establishment of a special select committee to examine the Ofaoko case. Chief Judge Fenton, now retired from the bench, had to appear before the committee for questioning and was cross-examined closely by Stout about the practices of the court. Most extraordinary feature of this little drama was Fenton's own repudiation of the Native Lands Acts. He said, being to a certain extent a fellow Māori, now this may startle some contemporary historians, but in fact that was how Fenton was perceived at the time. Um, he said, if I had seen in 1865 what the result of our acts would have been, I do not think I should have assisted in their introduction. Fenton drafted the 1865 Act, I should add. I should have said, let colonisation go to the wall. It, the Native Land Court, has destroyed the race. Now, Fisher and Sterling see this as an example of crocodile tears. As well as being a bit harsh, in my opinion, um, this is perhaps to obscure the historical significance of Fenton's admission. That at the end of his career, Fenton could have concluded that the Native Lands Acts were a disaster and that the court had destroyed the Māori people seems important. Fenton himself turned out to be a critic of the court in the end. Newly appointed judges of the court uh, itself could be amazingly scathing about their own colleagues and the reputation of the court generally. An example of that, one of the judges in the Liberal period, is Judge Barton. Barton had formerly been Wee Parata's counsel in the Wee Parata case, uh, and he was well known as a pugnacious and highly aggressive barrister uh, who had been put in jail a few times by the judges for contempt. Um, uh, he uh, saw himself as something of a new broom, a reformer and a moderniser who thought it was time for the uncertainty over land titles, deriving from transfers of land held under memorial of title under the land court to be put to an end. One gets the impression from his judgments and his writings that he saw the rest of the mostly unqualified judges of the court as an inferior species. He took a dim view of the ability of his colleagues to deal with the complexity of statutory Maori land law. And I reproduce an extract from one of his judgments there. I won't read it all out, but some key phrases are the provisions of the statute are committed to untrained and unprotected judges, goes on, I quite admit the impropriety of allowing judges, meaning his colleagues on the bench, selected for their skill in Maori language rather than for any other qualification to be taken as guides through the difficult channels of English law. In short, according to Barton, the judges of the court, excluding himself, that is, had no legal training, could not understand statutes, knew nothing about the common law, were afraid to offend powerful private parties, and had been appointed more for their ability to understand Māori than for any other reason. Barton, on the other hand, probably had a very poor command of Māori, but was certainly an experienced and eloquent lawyer, and someone who was never deferential to politicians or officials. Um, in 1893, an organisation calling itself the Native Land Reform League attracted a certain amount of newspaper attention. The organisation became prominent in early 1893 and was presided over by Josiah Clifton Firth, formerly a prominent run holder in the southeastern Waikato. He was sometimes referred to in the press as the Duke of Matamata. The League pressed for reform of Maori land law. It claimed to have the interests of Maori and Pākehā equally at heart and to be politically bipartisan. And I quote there, um, uh, um, some reportage of the foundation of the, this organisation. I note that the goals, uh, may, its, its goals may seem to be contradictory. 
One was providing for the management of tribal lands by owners acting in a cooperative capacity, that is, to give Māori landowners some kind of corporate status. And this might seem eminently laudable, even ahead of its time. However, the other goal, quote, throwing open of the surplus lands of the Māoris for settlement, seems rather less meritorious, perhaps even something of a giveaway. Temporaries may not have seen things in quite this light, however. Given the seemingly obvious and inexorable decline of the Māori population, it will have seemed simply sensible to do away with the complexities of the Māori land system, restore collective tenures to some degree, provide for full racial equality, and facilitate safe and rapid alienation of unwanted lands to settlers. The association began well and began to campaign actively for bipartisan legislation to remedy what its supporters saw as the Māori land mess. And there are numerous reports in the newspaper about its progress. It seems, however, to have been short-lived, and it's difficult to assess its effectiveness or importance. There may be connections between the association's campaign and the enactment of the Native Land Court Act 1894, which finally established a native appellate court and restored crown preemption to the whole country, that is, shutting down all private purchasing of Maori land. Both important steps, but hardly radical innovations. It's important to separate out the various shades of opinion amongst those who were critical of the court, however. Maori had their own reasons for concern about the native land court, of course, although they also continued to bring cases before it. Uh, for whatever reason. There were those who criticised the court not for acting against Māori interests, but because, so it was said, for being much too indulgent towards Māori. Some people complained that the court let Māori speak before it at unnecessary length. E. H. Williams, a lawyer from Napier, told the Rees Carroll Commission in 1891 that the judges were not quick enough in stopping evidence when it has nothing to do with the point at issue, fearing, I suppose, that if any evidence is rejected, a rehearing will be applied for. Sometimes denouncing the court, which seemed to have few friends and defenders, was part of a political or even a courtroom strategy. Often factional linkages between Māori chiefly leaders and Pākehā politicians were played out in the court and in parliamentary inquiries. Politics was much more confrontational, argumentative and rhetorical than the sanitised and managed variety that we have had to become acclimatised to. Rhetorical about outbursts about the court were often simply that. What also interests me about this is that uh, the courtroom and parliament together seem to be something of a forum for factional politics between Pākehā politicians and Māori. That is, the elite politics of the day. Uh, were partly a uh, combination of alliances and oppositional groups in which both Māori and Pākehā were interconnected. Someone whose criticisms of the court and the legislation needs to be taken with an especially large grain of salt is William L. Rees, the Rees Carroll Commission. His remarks in the Rees Carroll Commission report of 1891 were much more a Liberal Party pre than an object of assessment of the court and of the law. Really, if you read his report closely, it's a champion, it champions the rights of small settlers as those who should benefit from Crown acquisition of Māori land. If any lawyer was personally entangled in every aspect of Māori land practice, that person was Rees. He was involved in practically every Supreme Court and Court of Appeal Māori land case from the, the East Coast region of any importance, of which there were many where he constantly pressed every conceivable argument that he could, and he was also engaged in endless cases in the Native Land Court, Native Appellate Court, and Native Validation Court. He too was connected with an important Māori leader, in his case the East Coast Chief and Member of Parliament, Wipere, with whom he was linked in the disastrous fiasco of the East Coast Trusts Affair. To salvage the foundering trust scheme, which was burdened with a huge mountain of debt, a good part of it deriving from Reese's own legal fees, Reese and Wee Perry made every effort they could to defeat the interests of European purchasers or transferees in order to ensure that more blocks could be added into the trust estate to prevent the whole project from sinking. This is not to say that some of the criticisms that Reese advanced in his 1891 report were wholly lacking in foundation. When Reese complained, 
that the law was increasingly complex, he was right. But it can also be said that one important source of this complexity was Rees himself and his propensity to bring complicated appeal and review proceedings in the ordinary courts. These decisions created confusion in their own right, which necessitated further legislative tinkering, uh, which added to the very complexities he complained about. Historians thus need to be a little careful about deploying late 19th century rhetorical outbursts about the court to support their own, typically hostile interpretation of the Native Land Court and the Native Lands Acts. It is certainly risky to assume that critics of the court were necessarily fellow Māori or that the court's defenders were indifferent to Māori well-being. Mostly, Pākehā wanted to see a continuous flow of land, moving from Māori onto the land market for them to buy. The Native Land Court could sometimes seem to be a very inefficient means of achieving this goal, and this was why it was often criticised. Having bought former Māori land, purchasers wanted secure titles, something which the system did not necessarily deliver, as for instance the endless litigation over the Wai Ngoromia 2 and 3 blocks at Gisborne, uh, which uh, eventually reached the Privy Council as the well-known decision, or at least well-known uh, in law schools, decision in assets in Meriroihi which established the primacy of the land transfer system over Māori land titles. Yet the fact that the court was so consistently attacked by many well-informed people is obviously important, an indication that whatever perceived value it might have had in the 1860s and 1870s was rapidly evaporating. <clears throat> New Zealand was changing, and this was reflected in the law and the legal profession. The archetypical lawyer of the 1870s was Francis Dart Fenton, chief judge of the Native Land Court, former frontier official and high Victorian liberal. His equivalent could be said for the liberal period could be said to be Sir John Salmond, professor of law at Victoria University College and then solicitor general who went on to become a judge of the Supreme Court and Court of Appeal and the author of an internationally recognised textbook on jurisprudence. Salmond believed in the enlightened and progressive state not mid-Victorian laissez-faire liberalism. Law was a science, the Native Lands Acts and their endless amendments an embarrassing and unprincipled mess left from an earlier era. Fenton, notwithstanding historians say about him, regarded himself as a fellow Māori. Salmond was a technocrat who had little contact with the Māori world and no interest in the amateur ethnography practiced by Fenton and his generation. Salmond played an important role in drafting the Native Lands Act 1909, which finally reduced the statutory labyrinth to some kind of rational order. In this great reform, Salmond admittedly was but a technician, but an important one. Real architects of the 1909 statute were Sir Robert Stout, James Carroll and the young Aparana Ngata. By their combined efforts, the statutory chaos was reduced to a principled code. Modernity was to catch up with Māori land law at last. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Richard. We have approximately 12 minutes for questions, so if I just uh, open the floor to anyone who would like to direct a question at um, one or all of the panel members. in so many areas and I guess I'm hopeful that we'll come out with a principled code to turn it around my Sense of groundhog day. <laughs> um, what, what is very interesting in the
20th century is that the Māori Land Court, notwithstanding the fact that it's been so criticised by historians, um, you see that the government has had a consistent strategy of trying to remove more contentious areas of litigation from the Māori Land Court and place that in the safe hands, or perceived safe hands, of the ordinary courts. And uh, that occurred, um, for example, in some of the lit earlier litigation over, over lake beds. It's a consistent part of um, government policy in uh, the 1920s, 1930s. And I, I guess you could even see that, see that that is the case with the Foreshore and Seabed Acts of 2004 and, two, and the current Act of 2011. Um, there's also been uh, contemporary issues, or as you know, cases about the extent of the jurisdiction of the Māori Land Court and whether it can claim a jurisdiction over um, uh, Māori, uh, over non-Māori freehold land in certain circumstances, uh, and it has been repeatedly confined to a fairly narrow, par fairly na narrow path. In, in other words, the Māori Land Court has really been prevented from emerging as what you might call a Māori court in any broader or general sense and being confined to a quite, uh, quite, narrow, uh, quite narrow framework. And certainly that is the consistent theme that you see right throughout, this, right throughout the, not the 20th century. So Groundhog Day in a way, yes. Well, well, I guess first of all the key would be to look at, at those five sort of values and institutions that I mentioned uh, and, and look at the way in which the kinds of, of thinking and practice that goes along with each of those uh, and think about how those might be reflected in a constitution. I don't, I don't have any simple answers for how, how that, that would work, but you know, we, do, we do see, for example, the... Uh, um, I talked about in terms of the, the kind of flexibility that exists within tikanga Māori and the ability to uh, give priority to those values and particularly the idea of, of placing an emphasis on relationships and uh, maintaining balance in relationships. So I'd be looking for mechanisms that uh, within a constitutional structure put the focus on relationships, maintaining relationships and maintaining balance. says that mana is essential. It hasn't been given away. Papa Wanamata said something rather like different in 1922. So isn't my, so my challenge, I suppose, my widow to you, is uh, really there are different constitutional traditions and at different points in time, some concepts are being considered more important than others. Um, and then a uh, reflection perhaps from Miranda that one of the reasons that we know so little about the Portaikang and Parliaments is because they tend to be loyalist or neutral Māori and they don't get so much good press these days. So, uh, why, 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 thanks for raising that, David. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out was that, that these kind of core institutions that I talk about construct a Māori constitutional tradition and they, they drive Māori constitutional thought and practice. Now, that's not going to play out the same way in different situations and in different circumstances. So, um, when Ngata made those comments, I, I wouldn't suggest that a Māori constitutional tradition relies on um, Māori having mana 
what it relies upon is the concept of mana being important and thinking about where those power relationships are and how those dynamics work. So I don't, I don't see, the, uh, I, I'm, I'm quite happy with the idea, in fact, I, I am more than happy. I'd, I'd be disappointed if we didn't see lots of different Māori approaches to constitutional thought and practice, particularly in different um, historical and social and environmental circumstances. So I, I see that as being quite consistent. Yeah, I suppose I was um, part of what I was trying to think through is just again whether constitutionalism in the sense that I've been thinking about it as a process of founding or refounding is really particularly applicable or useful. It's, I mean, I think what I was trying to get to in this notion of translation is that the idea of the constitution is serving as what translators would call, call a third term, right, through which very different ideas about political uh, authority and practice are being kind of um, pushed. Right, but maybe constitutions aren't, aren't the best. You know, it can't, that, that's a very, it's a particular word. Whakapapa is a different word, and it has a different sort of imagination that goes along with it. And what I think, I think that, that piece by Nash is really interesting too, because I, I suppose what I'm interested in is, um, is when it becomes thinkable to, to imagine mana as something that can be given away. <laughs> that's, that's a, there's, a, there's a massive shift in, in imagination and conceptualization that's gone on for for one to even be thinking about mana as a kind of asset in the way that Nata was thinking about it by the early 20th century. I think, that, I think that needs to be elucidated and understood much more because these people in the loyalist kotahitanga in the 1890s are not talking about culture, they're not talking about assets, and they're not talking about the, the kinds of ways in which um, political concepts can be, can be given away in that kind of way that Nata is 30 years later, which is incredible. I think that's an incredible kind of shift in conceptual Māori political thinking that has kind of, as you, as you say in your paper, has gone um, kind of discussed that you're giving us tomorrow. So, yeah, I think that, I think all of this needs to be uh, discussed, worked up, debated a lot more than it has been. Because the Crown is the significant, you know, figure that, that is being related to in all these different ways. So. Yep. Um, important in terms of, of how, you, how we think about those other concepts that I've talked about. Um, so, so how you identify what's involved in whanaungatanga. I think you need to, need to have in your mind, well, what is, you know, what is really at the heart of this? What is, um, so, so those concepts are important. I, I personally wouldn't place them in the same kind of category as, as these other ones that I've talked about, but, but as I say, that's, that's not a definitive answer. That's, um, there are lots of different ways of describing how these concepts interact and interrelate. For instance, whanaungatanga operates, and whanaungatanga and mana, two important concepts there, is that it does allow for people to have relationships, uh, but also to have autonomy as well. Uh, and so there are different levels in terms of the way that can play out. And even if you look at iwi and hapu and whanau, you can see the kind of different uh, levels of authority and autonomy being played out within those groups. And those are not fixed boundaries either. Those change and develop as well. So I think that, that's yeah, quite consistent. Yeah, that's 3.30, so I'd like you to join me one more time in thanking our speakers.